Thanks, Janice, and thanks everyone for being here today. I'm continuing my trend from last year of presenting work to you that's hot, in, hot off the press. So it's work that I'm working on at the moment. It's not published. It's something that's still in progress. So I'm doing this in partly a strategy to exploit the expertise in this room. So I'm hoping that you'll tell me which aspects of this work you're finding the most interesting. So before I go on, I'd just like to acknowledge some collaborators in this work. This is a project really done in collaboration with Kath Lovelock at UQ, John Pandolfi, who's a CI in the center, and Ruth Reef, who did her PhD with researchers in the center and is also based at UQ. For the students in the room, I'd just like to highlight here that apparently random connections you might make with other people when you're at conferences or when you're in the field can result in productive research collaborations along the line. So I first met Ruth in about 2004 when we were both tutoring a field course at Heron Island. Uh, also to point out that this work is, well, the story I'm telling you today about the corals is also part of a larger project working on mangroves, algae at these five sites along the Queensland coast. So kicking off today with a famous ratio that should be familiar to some people in the audience, what you're seeing there, 106.16.1, refers to the elemental ratio of carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus in organisms in the environment. So this ratio was first discovered by Redfield back in 1934, recognizing that for every one element of phosphorus we have in organisms, there's 16 nitrogen and 106 carbon. So we've known about this uh, ratio for decades. Uh, back in those early times, uh, Redfield discovered that this ratio was present not just in plankton tissues, but also within the dissolved nutrient pools in seawater. And the idea at that time was that the ratio of elements within the body tissues of organisms reflected that of the environment. And that view persisted in the literature for quite a long time. More recently though, there's been a development of a field called ecological stoichiometry, which is really exploring the causes and consequences of variation in elemental composition in body tissues. And this field is recognizing that actually lots of factors like life history traits, nutrition, trophic level, lead to variation in this elemental composition. In particular, phosphorus is highly variable in the tissues of organisms. And that's what I'll be talking to you about today is some of the hypotheses trying to explain this variation in phosphorus in tissues. So this idea of Redfield's or this uh, information he developed that organisms are mostly carbon-based is something that's very well known and something that's propagated into popular culture. So if you remember that movie Evolution with David Duchovny, some of you might remember it. In that movie, the scientists made a leap of logic that we could kill nitrogen-based aliens by treating them with selenium because arsenic is something that's toxic to carbon-based humans. Also, if you remember from Star Wars, when Han Solo was punished for not paying his gambling debts to Jabba the Hutt, he was frozen in carbonite. So again, showing uh, that we have this general recognition of this carbon-based life forms in most of our organisms in nature. So aside from funny popular culture references, there's actually a range of biological principles and laws that actually constrain the tissue composition of organisms. The first is this law of conservation of energy and mass, which is a recognizing that matter can't be created or destroyed, it can simply change forms. This principle also underlies the use of things like stable isotope techniques and fatty acid composition techniques in tracing the diets of organisms in food webs. It's also a principle that living organisms are constructed from a set of macromolecules. So most cells have a cell membrane, which is a phospholipid bilayer, which surrounds composites of proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. So in fact, the elemental composition, that ratio of carbon to phosphorus to nitrogen, actually reflects the relative content of these different macromolecules and can also reflect the dietary composition or the diets that those organisms are eating in nature. So this principle underlies something called the growth rate hypothesis, which is a general leading hypothesis in this field of ecological stoichiometry. So this hypothesis seeks to explain variation in phosphorus content in the tissues of organisms in relation to their growth rates. And it's based on this notion that for growth to occur requires protein synthesis. For protein synthesis to occur um, requires ribosomal RNA, and that's something that's quite rich in phosphorus. So we'd expect that organisms that are growing fast would have 
high RNA to DNA ratios in their tissues, and that's underlying this variation in phosphorus. There's actually quite a growing body of evidence in the literature supporting this hypothesis. This first example here is showing you growth rates of snails and the relationship between growth rate and the amount of carbon per phosphorus in those snail tissues. So you can see for fast-growing snails have more phosphorus or less carbon per phosphorus in their tissues, so supporting this growth rate hypothesis. Also similar examples for zooplankton here showing the relationship between plankton plankton RNA percentage and the percentage phosphorus in those tissues, again a positive correlation between those two processes, and similarly showing that plankton growth is associated with the percentage of RNA in plankton tissues. So a general hypothesis seeking to explain variation in elemental composition of tissues. So if, uh, Often the case that with these general hypotheses, if we want to understand how general they are, whether they relate to all organisms, we can test those hypotheses with species that differ in their characteristics from most organisms. So reef corals are these type of species. They have some unique characteristics that challenge some of those general ecological theories. And by general theories here, I'm referring to things like the metabolic theory of ecology that explains how uh, metabolic rates scale with body size and also other things like dynamic, dynamic energy budget theory, which explains the allocation of uh, energy between growth and reproduction in tissues. So corals have some unique characteristics that mean they might not match these predictions that we see play out for other organisms. So they're modular, their tissues are organized at two levels, at the polyp level and the colony level. They have external skeletons, so tissue growth and skeletal growth are compartmentalized. They're symbiotic, there's this complex sharing of nutrients between the symbionts and the host tissue, and they're also mixotrophic, so they're both autotrophic, getting energy from photosynthesis, and heterotrophic, consuming plankton from the environment. In the literature, we know that this variation in phosphorus is much greater for autotrophic organisms compared to heterotrophic organisms, so another factor that might mean corals don't conform to the general hypotheses we see and um, playing out for other organisms and that's why they're a good uh, study system for exploring these kinds of processes. So with that in mind, the aims of this project were to determine for corals whether among species variation in elemental composition is associated with variation in growth rate. So does this growth rate hypothesis hold true for corals? Also to assess whether variation in elemental composition reflects some variation between species in their investment to calcification or skeletal growth or whether they're autotrophic or heterotrophic, because those are characteristics that are different for corals than other species. And also because there's so limited evidence in the literature about these elemental ratios for corals, we aim to just more broadly understand spatial and temporal variation in tissue composition for corals. So the study design here was to just go out and sample corals at many different locations along the Queensland coast. So we had samples taken from Lizard Island, the Keppel's Magnetic Island, Heron and Lady Elliot Island. So these lo locations are all located at different latitudinal positions and they're also differing in their distance from the shoreline. So ranging from about five and a half kilometers for Magnetic Island up to about 81 kilometers for Lady Elliot. So we, and it's a collective we, because I wasn't actually involved in the sampling, went and collected uh, 493 coral samples from covering 76 different species from, or from spread across these different study locations. The samples were all about eight centimeters in size and collected across a depth range between zero and 15 meters. Samples were brought back to the lab, tissue was removed, uh, the RNA and DNA was quantified using an iridium bromide fluorescence assay. Freeze-dried tissues were then uh, sent off for analysis for carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus content at the UC Davis Stable Isotope Lab. We've also analyzed the nitrogen rate stable isotopes and carbon stable isotopes for those tissues, but I won't be presenting those data today. And to assess this growth rate hypothesis, we then went and compared uh, these DNA to RNA ratios from these data with coral growth data that's been published in a recent review paper led by Morgan Pratchett and Kristen Anderson from the center. So for the data analysis, you can imagine we've got a large sample set, about 493 samples. They're all collected at different locations that differ in their latitude and distance from the shoreline. They're also collected across a range of depths. 
and we've got our 76 different coral species to contend with. So the aim of the data analysis was to tease apart which of those variables was contributing most to the observed variation in these elemental compositions and also in the RNA to DNA ratio. So we used a formal model selection approach based on the Kayaki weights to tease apart the contributions of each of those variables to the variation in the data. You can see the variables listed there. We broke them into categories. We've got morphological variables relating to colony shape as an indicator of uh, energy or elemental investment in calcification, and also polyp size, reflecting that modular growth of these colonies. Some phylogenetic variables, so we had species, genus, and family identity in these uh, model variables that we compared, and also these environmental variables, latitude, distance, season, and depth. And we use this model selection approach to assess the relative support for each of these variables in determining tissue composition. So under some results, and the first key result from this work is that fast-growing corals do have a higher RNA to DNA ratio consistent with that growth rate hypothesis. So this plot you're looking at here shows the relative support for each of these different variables in explaining RNA to DNA ratio in these coral tissues. You can see that among the morphological variables, both colony shape and polyp diameter did contribute or were strongly supported as variables that influenced RNA to DNA ratio. For the phylogeny variables, it was genus that was really contributing most to explaining variation in those ratios. And for the environmental data, it was mainly depth-related variation in RNA to DNA. To show you the data rather than the relative support for each of those variables, here we have growth form because colony morphology was an important determinant of RNA to DNA ratio coral growth forms on the x-axis, and the relative amounts of RNA to DNA in those tissues. The tables and the staghorns are known to be quite fast growing compared to things like our bubble corals and free living corals. So we do see from this coarse scale some indication that fast growing corals do have higher RNA to DNA ratios. But comparing this to actual data, here what you're looking at is average RNA to DNA in coral tissue, and this time we're pooling across different, or pooling samples within each genus, so each data point represents a separate coral genus. And on the y-axis we have growth rate from uh, that broad scale review of coral growth rates that was published earlier this year. And at that scale we can see a positive correlation between the amount of RNA and DNA in coral tissue and average growth rates of those genera uh, from that large uh, data set. So relatively strong evidence that we do have a positive relationship between growth rate and RNA to DNA ratio for these corals. Moving on to some of the other results, uh, I mentioned earlier one of the aims was just to understand more broadly spatial temporal variation in these ratios. What you're looking at here is the percentage of phosphorus in coral tissues across different seasons. So we also sampled these coral fragments at different seasons. We can see that phosphorus content is much higher in spring and decreases seasonally down to being lowest in winter. I think this pattern is actually reflecting uh, lipid content in tissues associated with reproduction of these colonies, with spa uh, spawning and reproduction most often call, uh, occurring in late spring and early summer. For the nitrogen content, this was a, a, a result that we didn't expect. We actually found increasing nitrogen content with distance from the mainland. So the sites that we sampled had differing distances from the mainland. Distance was important in explaining variation in nitrogen content. And you can see this positive relationship. So I'd originally anticipated we'd have higher nitrogen percentage in inshore environments because those are more influenced by terrestrial runoff. But that's not what these data were showing. And we also found some signal that the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus decreases with increasing polyp size. So colonies with large polyp diameters having lower uh, nitrogen per phosphorus in their tissues. So we're still interrogating these data. There's a lot more data and results that I could show you. Just to give an overview, though, due to time constraints, what these uh, study is showing us is that fast-growing corals do have more RNA per DNA. But actually, this relationship we're seeing uh, isn't explaining variation in phosphorus content. So although growth rate morphology was explaining RNA to DNA ratios, it wasn't important in explaining variation in phosphorus content. 
So the logic that RNA to DNA content is explaining phosphorus variation in coral tissues doesn't seem to be playing out in this example. We also found oh, one other point to make there was I showed you the seasonal pattern in phosphorus content. And I think the reason why uh, we're not seeing this three-way relationship between RNA, DNA, growth, and phosphorus is that phosphorus uh, associated with RNA might be masked by that high presence of phosphorus stored in lipid. And I'm nearly on my last slide. So broader implications from this work is uh, one of the important ecosystem services that coral reefs provide is this role in global biogeochemical cycles. This kind of eco-stoichiometry research can inform us about things like the fluxes of nutrients both between uh, organisms within ecosystems and between ecosystems like reefs and the broader environment. So this study is showing us that the growth rate uh, hypothesis is not, might not be relevant for species that are storing a lot of phosphorus in their tissues and this is consistent with some other work in the literature. And I'll just acknowledge collaborators and thank you all.